Vicar's Lore, the backstory and how we got to where we are now. Extracted from details from maps, cosmetics, props, ARGs, and now the cassettes, has been a major focus of mine since I first picked up this game and made a video about an easter egg found in the old shelter. Now it's time for us to review everything we have as of now. So sit back, regardless if you're a new Vicar player curious about the lore, or a veteran of the lore who wants to watch the progress we've made. I now present to you all Figure's Lore, The Complete Timeline, Part 1, The War. The last episode didn't really have my mic in it, because my mic's been giving me some real problems. It's, it's not one to deal with me, so I we finally found a fun, interesting game that isn't Apex Legends. And we're not going to let you just communicate. Explaining what led to the nuclear war. We're going to be covering the complete rigor timeline, or at least what I've put together. It's becoming clearer and clearer that the ones who dropped the nuke were likely the USSR. story, we must first begin with history. The Cold War was a time period in history where the capitalist West and the communist East lay in careful suspense over the proposition of nuclear annihilation. The West was united under the cause of NATO, while the East lay under the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. In our timeline, this conflict would never escalate and eventually the East would collapse under the desire for liberal reforms, leaving the West as the victors. However, in Vigor's case, this is not true. In the Vigor timeline, the war does escalate, and to find where we must turn to other bohemian games to gather an idea. So thus, we enter Armaverse. In 1985, we find Arma Flashpoint Cold War Crisis, a game that takes place on a small island called Everon. On this island, NATO has a military base which is attacked by rogue Soviet soldiers under control of one Alexei Cuba, and a series of battles and engagements follow as both sides attempt to gain control. Cuba has conducted the invasion under the goal of delegitimatizing the government back in Moscow and to create a new leader for the Soviets to rally around, this being himself. He also wished to throw the world into a third world war, attempting to use Scud missiles to provoke a nuclear annihilation. In the bad endings of this game, his plans are made into a reality in some form depending on the ending, and for quite some time it was believed among the Vigor theorists that this was a point where we entered Vigor's timeline. However, recently Bohemia has released Arma Reforger, which takes place in 1989. This game sees both major powers again at blows on the island of Everon opening a second potential spot for the war to end all wars to begin. Regardless how the war began, we can now transition over to what happened during the war, and really where the lore of Vigor begins. By turning to Soviet war plans, we can quickly understand what the Soviet goals for an invasion of Norway would be as well as what the NATO response would be. Soviets would invade through the Finnmark provenance and, per the NATO doctrine, likely meant very little response, as the flat, low-populated, difficult-to-defend region would be given up to allow for defense lines to establish further east. Going further east, we reach the Great Troms region, where Vigor takes place, and the location of some of the battles we can see in the game. So the Soviet line pushed from Finnmark towards the NATO defenses, and we know that at least initially, they must have had some success. We see this in the form of, of the Battle of Drog, a battle where in the margins of the map we see military failure as well as the fact that the map is completely occupied by Soviet armor. This can also be seen in the occupations of Vicky, Deverg, and Grantham. However, this success wouldn't last. The first major battle where we can see the tides shifting against the Soviet line is in Bridges. 
In this map, we see that the Soviet line must have taken the north side of the river and wished to push across the bridge. And originally, it was able to do so, pushing into the fields just south of the river. However, the success would not last as NATO reinforcements and partisan fighters seemed to fight back, forcing the Soviet line back over the river, with the Soviets taking extremely high casualties, as large amounts of armor was destroyed. The defeat at Bridges wasn't a one-off though, as it seems the Soviet line as a whole was beginning to collapse. Turning over to Deverg, though the area was abandoned by NATO troops, the Soviet faced heavy resistance from partisan Norwegian fighters. Fighters who were able to reclaim entire sectors of the town and deal heavy casualties to the attacking Soviet army. The Soviet line losing battles against random partisans isn't a good sign for an army that is trying to occupy a country. Though they were losing on the front lines, we can also see how the war was unfolding for the poor citizens caught behind their war machine. On Visk, we see the Soviets establish a base of operations and forcing the citizens living in the area to leave. However, the defeats on the front lines was beginning to cause chaos and loss of morale. This can first be seen on Vicky, as fighters in this situation seem to be paranoid, all aiming their turrets out at the frozen lake and having destroyed the tunnels that lead out of the city. They were ready for a NATO offensive to retake their position, despite the fact that Vicky was quite far behind the front lines. But in other areas, this paranoia may have been apt. Seeing as on snow deck the lighting is clear enough that on the water we can see what could easily be a battleship waiting to perhaps signify that NATO was intending on retaking this lost land. With paranoia and lost morale, an overstretched army and several major strategic losses, the Soviets still had one thing going for them, the conquest of the majority of the major town of Grothheim. The initial battle of Grothheim was a solid win for the Soviets, having destroyed decent amounts of NATO armor. Add to this that Grothheim is one of the largest towns shown in the game, and the Soviets holding it was a sign they could still stand a chance in this war. Within Grothheim was the Grothheim Avis, the largest newspaper press in the area, and with the silencing of this, the partisans couldn't spread rebellious propaganda as easily, despite the fact that this propaganda is seen everywhere across the town. But this gem of theirs was not set to last. To begin, there was still a detachment of NATO troops holding a tiny part of the town. The Soviets, already busy enough dealing with the partisans, were unable to finally destroy the last bits of the NATO forces in the town. But even worse, slightly to the north lay the Kirsten Dam, a massive fortification held by Norway and NATO, a fortification with massive amounts of NATO reinforcements who were preparing to sweep south and liberate Grothheim. The first part of this liberation occurred in the Battle of Kirsten, as Soviet forces were completely outgunned and outnumbered and forced to retreat south of the area, meaning that Grothheim was now on the front lines. While we don't know for sure who pressed the button first or why they made that choice, to me, the loss of Kirsten right now seems to to be the most likely reason for the Soviets to hit the button, seeing as it was now inevitable that they would lose Grontheim, a town they simply couldn't afford to lose. To add to this, we see that in Kirsten there are a lot of NATO troops in transit heading south who never arrived at their final destination. That is all we really know right now about the war. However, there are some minor stories and lore tidbits we can add in here and there that also occurred before the nukes fell. One example is that before the war, there was a mass murderer who killed at least six people in the region. This mass murderer is believed to have resided in the murder shack on Grotham. We don't know much about them, but there are hints that the murderer may have been methodical in nature, seeing as the easter egg connected to them connected to Pennywise. Also, in the shack, we see the murder bear who could possibly be the cause. We also know that the war that occurred accelerated technology to some degree. As some of the guns seen in the game were invented after the 91 occurrence date of the game. And finally, we know that sometime before the start of the game, the ship on Anakin was beached on the shore, with some minor theories stating that it could have been done by a ship in the region. We can finish up with the little details we know regarding what happened in the cassettes prior to the nukes. We know that Adam was stationed somewhere near Anakin, and there was an incident where Ada Conduct did an experiment that went wrong and killed Lars' parents. 
but that is everything that is known in the lore of relevance that occurred before the nuclear apocalypse. However, we are only halfway done. In the next video, I will cover all the lore following the nuclear apocalypse, which focuses on the seasonal lore as well as the cassettes lore. Hopefully y'all enjoyed this and are excited for part 2. Until then, this has been Pata Chips, and I hope to see y'all next time.